Hello, KCIW listeners, and welcome to Curry Cafe, where we put together a panel of volunteers and guests who discuss various topics from whimsical and fun to more serious subjects. My name is Ray Gary, and welcome to another edition of the Curry Cafe. Curry Cafe, we sit around and just talk about just about anything. We'll pick up subject and talk about it today. And sometimes we know what we're talking about, but as a general rule, we don't. But today we are in great luck because we actually have somebody who knows something. If he would introduce himself and tell us what he knows. <laughs> ah, that could be quick. Um, I'm Bill Gorham. Um, as I had mentioned to uh, to uh, everybody before, um, I've got a PhD in marine biology. I'm one of those people that actually did go through and get a, a biology, a marine biology degree. Um, from I grew up in Illinois, and that's where I lo- love to lo- learn to love the ocean. And you go, wait a second. <laughs> but we had summer vacations in Maine, and it was such a change from the Midwest. Um, And so I got uh, uh, several degrees, worked for about 10 years teaching, and then found that I really liked uh, application of things better. So I spent 30 years doing environmental consulting. I retired in 2017 and moved here to Brookings. And um, at that point, I got uh, particularly involved in climate change. And I'd always been an environmentalist and had worked on a lot of different things, but it gave me a chance to dig into the topic and activities around climate change. So that's how I got invited to today's conversation. Well, what do you think, Rick? You think he'll, will he be all right to keep here? Uh, Yeah, I'm uh, Rick McNamer, high school education, (laughs) but, (laughs) but excited to learn because this is a, this is a subject that really means a lot to me. So I'm glad uh, Bill's here. Why don't we start out, Bill, with defining climate? I can remember a few years ago there was a some politician went into Congress carrying a snowball and said, how can you say the planet is warming? Yeah. So explain why that's nonsense. <laughs> uh, well, climate is the long-term uh, aspects about the weather we have. The weather is, is what we experience day to day or week by week. Climate is the overall... Um, trends where things go over over um, decades, uh, warmer or cooler, and beyond that, it's uh, on a much different time scale. So that's why we talk about the, and it, it becomes very challenging, people experience the weather and you are aware of, if you've been around a long enough time, that the things seem to have changed. Problem with that is they seem to have changed, but we are very very poor recorders of that, and it's all affected by our perceptions. And so by trying to deal with with um, good, reliable resources uh, of records of how things have changed, that way we can see what sorts of, uh, how things are different over a long scale, and there's the climate. Now, does that include floods, droughts, wildfires? And you've touched on one of the biggest biggest difficulties with um, going beyond the simple thing of changes in temperatures that are caused by an increase of greenhouse gases. Now, it's uh, what I try to do is go back to the physics, and it's very simple. We've known for over 150 years that there are certain gases, carbon dioxide being one of them, that if you increase the concentrations of that, that traps heat, and it's interesting how long um, the science has shown through experimentation that carbon dioxide is a heat trapping gas. And what's also amazing is that it's been for over 150 years that early scientists had said, you know, if, if we increase the amount of CO2 in the air or these greenhouse gases, that's gonna affect the, uh, the climate, it's overall, the warm the ocean the um, the whole earth is going to be warming up, and so it's interesting because even though those projections were a long long time ago, and they've been refined and changed and updated, they were surprisingly accurate. Um, there's some 
excellent examples of um, in the 1960s and 70s, Exxon, at the time it was Exxon, now ExxonMobil, they hired some of the best scientists um, that they could get. And the scientists did their modeling, did some fairly simple modeling. That modeling has continued to evolve, but their projections were basically spot on, which is interesting because that was not the sort of stuff that Exxon wanted to hear because they recognized that their product, burning of the fossil fuels, produces these greenhouse gases. And so um, that has been a big controversy. Well, how do we, uh, what changes do we have to have now? You know, long ago when I was young and naive, uh, we had a lot of controversy over the Vietnam War. And one of the things the anti-war protesters were proclaiming is that the military industrial complex wants to keep this going because they're making a ton of money. And I can remember as a 20-something-year-old, like I said, naive, thinking, how could any company want to make money off the death of even one person, let alone thousands of people and thousands of people? Well, I'm not so naive anymore. Now I, I, I can see that the oil companies, coal companies, and people who produce this type of thing, they're obviously aware. They have scientists, too, of, of what's going on and what they're causing. And... They're pretty much doing it for, for the money. I mean, there's things they could be doing to make things better, right? You, all you have to do is look at their profits um, in the last, uh, certainly over the last decade, but since the um, Ukraine war, um, they're making obscene profits. And yeah, and it's not just the, the oil companies because there are a variety of ma major um components of the economy, the world economy, that are contributing to that, whether you're talking about steel and concrete, which are the main building materials, both of which contribute a lot to the uh, carbon dioxide. Um, agriculture has, you know, their fundamental big ag is doing a lot with pesticides, herbicides, um, basically uh, make things as simple as possible. And then you have to buy more uh, herbicides and more, and that's then powered by the fossil fuel for the trucks and the, the combines. And, and these guys are kind of penny pinchers, I think. I lived in Alaska during the Exxon Valdez, and I, I still lived there when, when Exxon finally had its settlement. Now, I had friends who were fishermen who were destroyed. They were ruined. They had to go find something else to do. And Exxon just kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it until they, what they had to pay people was practically nothing because they had the big bucks. Yeah. And how about the plastic industry? Boy, I tell you, I mean, it's kind of my big complaint all the time. But um, the more I walk, well, we talked earlier about walking the beach. I can't believe going out there and picking up all of the stuff just on Chrissy Field Beach, which is maybe a half a mile stretch that I see every once in a while, and you times that by the world. I mean, I've, I've read about these, uh, some of the islands that are getting inundated with plastic waste and the infamous plastic in the middle of the ocean. I can't think of what I'm... The plastic gyre. Okay. And I, I, some people just deny that's even there, but I believe that's really a a I, deal out there. I feel like having a little bit of a, a direct experience with that. And just like you've said, um, I walk the beach on north of the, the Windchuck, and it's almost um, a guarantee that after some of the, the big storms we have, that the beach will just be littered with plastics. And if there's anything, there are two things that happen that come up most. It's the single-use plastic uh, bottles, which I absolutely hate. And then there are an awful lot of golf balls that come up. Really? Yeah. Seeing them. And not sure why. People teeing off into the ocean, evidently. I would, I have no basis for saying that, but I certainly think so. <laughs> well, you yeah, know, it's that, either that or off a ship someplace or a yeah, boat. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, it's, it's, the problem is that out of sight, out of mind, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter until you happen to be on the beach or if you're be on the beach on a regular basis. I mean, there are times when over a week we have overfilled our trash can by picking up trash. Yeah, and done it. So it's done it. It's amazing. Yeah. 
and so yeah, the the plastics industry is the other half of the fossil fuel industry because it's all being coming from the fossil fuels, and the plastics are not readily uh, recycled. No, irrespective of what they say. And a lot of people say, well, all right, we will be green. We'll take the plastics and we will convert them. And when they convert them, they will either put it back for more plastics, which is uh, on the order of 10, 20% maybe. But the balance goes into converting the plastics to the uh, fuels and then goes in as fuels. So they're still being burned. So it just adds more steps to it. What about this... Uh thing that was in the paper a while ago about they uh, develop a bacteria or something that eats the plastic. Be I, I, I'm not much of a scientist, but I do remember uh, I've heard the that term. That <laughs> yeah. I was actually <laughs> thinking, great, maybe somebody young and smart's starting to figure this stuff out. Well, well I don't know. But yeah. the, the One of the phrases I remember is that matter is indestructible. So if these little whatevers are eating up the plastic and then they're exuding pretty much the same stuff, I would think. Well, um, what they're doing is, because it's organics and the plastic is just organics, it's tied together very effectively. Most of the, the animal kingdom, most of the, the you know bacteria and such, they can't break down that sort of stuff. Kind of like cellulose in yeah. plants is not broken down by most types of... of uh, organisms. But there are some, the guts, the uh, fauna that lives in termites, guts, and things like that, they do it. They do a very good job of it. And so it's not surprising given the massive diversity of um, you know, creatures on the earth that there are some that can work on plastics. Well, the plastics haven't been around that long. And so it's not surprising that there are very few, but given how much is out there, it wouldn't be surprising that evolution is just pushing to get the critters that can eat that stuff. So these yeah. are these are obviously animals or something that already exists. Likely the bacteria. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, it's it's really interesting if you think about it. Um, I mean, I lived for a long time in Ventura County, and there are just is not surprising because off the Santa Barbara County, Ventura County, on up. Um, farther north, there are the offshore wells, and they are there because the oil is off there, and the Chumash would use the oil that would come up, the tar that would come up, the tar balls, and seal their boats and things, so it's always been there. Not surprisingly, there's a bacteria, there's a whole community there that will work on degrading those oils, so... Hmm. Mother Nature is pretty good at taking advantage of um, energy sources. And even though it doesn't seem like it, the plastics are just another energy source. So I'm surprised to hear you say they are, are organic. Um, it depends. Uh, it, it, organic in a, in a very chemical sense. And that's um, having done chemistry and done organic chemistry. And organic chemistry is basically it's carbon based and carbon and hydrogen and nitrogen, all those in different forms, that's going to be your, your organic materials. And when we, most people think about organic, they think about how plants are grown and, you know, with right. or without pesticides. So it's a distinct difference. Um, carbon is the, the basic building block for so many uh, compounds. Okay. And that's the fossil fuels. And then if you re rearrange them, then you can give them different properties that will be have great things you can do, like um, you know plastics are so much of a part of what we we have in our society now. They're great, but it's a one way system where you take the fossil fuels, you put them into the um, the the refineries, and then reformulate those. Take it to the um, the chemical industry, and then they make the plastics, which is fine. Except then, ultimately, they go into landfill or trash or get burned or out into the, the environment because there's a big, um, I mean, you can see the recycled letters and, and numbers on so many pieces of plastic, but very, very little is actually recycled. That's mm -hmm. what I understand. Yeah. Very little. And 
just the over, we talked about this, I think last week, but the over packaging of plastic. Huh. I needed, like all seniors, I lost some reading glasses, so I go buy some more the other day. I bought two, and I opened the one I found in one little pair of reading glasses. I had to cut, I counted, I think, eight, seven or eight of these little, I don't know what they're called, little tiny things with T at the end, and they, they put them in everything. Yeah. There was, what what is all that about? I mean, is that just the plastic industry saying, oh, man, just use more of these, and they're unnecessary, I think. They're, it's not clear what a lot of those are. Um, I agree. Uh, it, that they're horrible. I mean, it's interesting. I just learned fairly recently that there was a push to get rid of single-use plastic bags at grocery stores. We can't get them at, at Freddy's mm. now. And, and so right. um, apparently uh, some of the um, uh, companies decided that, you know, what we can do is we can have an exception because if you were to make plastic recyclable bags or actually reusable bags more appropriately. So they make them heavier so that you could then reuse them, which is a great idea. I mean, I bought um, stuff at Walmart and got the heavier bag, and I'm still using those. Apparently, that was a good idea that has not happened. And the amount of plastic that is being produced is, has gone up because the people will get the heavier plastic bags that are quote unquote reusable, mm -hmm. But they're not being reused. Not being reused. Yeah. And so it's like, great idea, great marketing, um, but you have to change how people do things. And unfortunately, in my opinion, we are, the whole world seems to be a wasteful, throwaway society. Absolutely. Oh, I be, really yeah. believe that. And it's, it's it's gotta be, gotta keep the economy going. Oh, gosh. And if again, I'll go back that... to a simple walk on the beach. It just, uh, it, it, every day that I, I'm out there, there's, yeah. you know, stuff and, uh, I, I don't know. It's, and it's nothing, very maddening to nothing you can get that. Fixed. Can't get anything fixed anymore. My, oh, uh, gosh. My microwave no. went out uh, a while back. I took it to the local place, and they said, oh, we can't get parts or something. Anyway, they didn't want to mess with it, so I went home and looked it up on YouTube, as I will with just about everything concerning my life, and found out for 80 bucks I can get this thing and, 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 and replace the part, and it's going to be great. So there must have been 785,000 screws that I had to take out and find again to put back in to get to this part. And every, every step of the instruction said, caution, don't touch this part or you'll die. Evidently, there's something in there that retains electricity to the point that it can actually kill you. So anyway, I got it all done and I got it put back together again and, 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 and put it on the counter and everything but the light worked and it was pretty good. And I was pretty proud of myself. I fixed a microwave oven. Mm. That lasted about two months and then it broke again. Then I looked into what a new microwave oven would cost and it was less than $100. So what, yeah, they actually just, the stuff that they get, my sister had a new LG, I think, washer dryer or something. And within a couple of years, it went out after the warranty. I mean, it's just big, expensive stuff oh, that they can't. Well, yeah, it's the planned obsolescence thing. Yeah. Our, our parents had washers and dryers and, and refrigerators that they had before we were born. Yes, yeah. Yeah, the idea of having things that last a long time, and a long time ends up being longer than the warranty, which gets shorter, exactly. shorter it seems like. I, it's I, I'm currently restoring a 96-year-old Model T, so that's going to last a long time, I hope. <laughs> uh, and, you know, back to the, we talked about the oil people, the coal people, I believe most of them are smart enough to believe that global warming and climate change are real. But I also I believe they just, they don't care because that's their industry. I mean, I guess you could give them a little leeway, but um, and anyway, that's my point. And I had a, a few examples here of a guy, uh, let me, <laughs> if I can get, well, here's one, Rick Santorum of all people talked about, uh, it's a phony theology, where I, I believe he himself wants a theocracy, but, uh, and says, man has dominion, according to the Bible, their God, take what we want. And I mean, I think I see that attitude a lot. Absolutely. And I'll very, include religion. I think religion plays a part sometimes in that. No, 
politics and religion. I don't think well, oh, both. Jesus or any of those folks ever said anything <laughs> like you just said. Yeah. It's really upsetting that this has become um, a political. You know, when Trump both. was first running for, for president, he said that global warming is a hoax made up by the Chinese to destroy our economy. No. Yeah. And there are probably people who will still quote him as saying that, and they're quite certain that he's right. Well, there are people that quote him, no matter what he says, he's right. And it's like, well, that's, that's a little uh, dogmatic yeah. is one thing. Uh, it's cultish, but that's just my when, chance. Yeah, mine too. When and I'm when, watching the news and they're about to interview him, I just fast forward to that. It's hard to, yeah, I can't. So here's a question. It's good, pretty deep and broad, Bill, but I had it. How do we, as because I am a believer in the global warming and climate change, as believers refute all of these crazy arguments that they they throw out out there. There are a bunch of good resources for that. There's one uh, web page or one uh, website. It's called um, uh, Skeptical Science. And Skeptical Science has now, it's been around for about, I'll say 15, 20 years. And they have, I think, probably by now 150, uh, say 180 to 200 plus of specific uh, myths. And in most and many of them, there are three levels of explanations. One is a very simple um, re review. Second is when you do a deeper dive. And the third is where you get, get all the physics, all the chemistry, and really go deep into it. Oh, wow. And so- I don't think I'll quit about two. Well, one and a half, but yeah. at least there's something. Okay, and oh, again, I'm the story. That was a, it. Was a website, skeptical science, skeptical science. Okay, and I believe it's skepticalscience.com. Okay, um, but they have been around for a long time. They uh, have um, done a variety of things. One of the ways of of trying to get people to not believe in these these harebrained schemes and say why it's wrong is they try to do uh, pre-inoculation, if you will, and work on uh, what you know are some of these myths and educate people on why, based on the physics, based on the chemistry, based on the basic principles, why they don't make sense. And having that means that we need to have well-educated kids that are learning science, that are trying to understand what critical thinking is, so you don't believe something just because somebody said it, give them a reason for that. Um, when I do so much of what I do when I'm trying to talk about climate change, as I said, go back to the basic science. Simple thing is that um, if you put more blankets on the bed, you'll get hotter. <laughs> Very simple. People don't understand that. Now, and you had asked, well, how does that relate to droughts and forest fires and everything else? That's a real challenge because it's multiple steps down. But if you build it up slowly but surely and say, all right, with more heat in the air, heat, uh, the, a warmer atmosphere holds more water. So if you put that warm water or warm air over a field, it's going to suck more water out. And that means you're going to have a, a water deficit in the field. If you're not getting as much rain, then you're going to have a more severe drought. That's going to lead to more um, drier plants, which are more susceptible to fires, more susceptible to harder or worse fires, more intense fires. And so it makes it different, difficult to, or, well, you have to go each step, each adds to it. Now, one of the, the um, clear things is that um, as you start to, to change the, the environment, change the amount of heat that's there, it has a cascade of effects. And so um, there, it, it's difficult to show a very simple relationship where X amount of additional heat has caused this fire or that fire. In fact, what you need to go do is to go back and say, in a historic record, what is the average uh, number of fires that has happened in a year? What's the average number of um, hurricanes and other uh, storm events. And the, what about the extreme events? And if you've seen it before, you've heard of a bell curve. 
Yeah. And it's, you know, average is kind of in the middle and the top and the extremes don't happen as much. By looking at how the number of storms, the extreme has changed, then you're saying, all right, we're talking about a longer time scale, a larger data set. That's where we're talking climate and not just weather. Okay. And so it's interesting. Um, I'd love to have the graphics here to show, but it's right clear. <laughs> it's moved across. And what was, and you've probably heard of them before, once in 100-year storms, once in 500-year storms, once in 1,000-year storms that are happening several times a century, several times a decade. More often. That, that these, that are, fire, these fires you're talking about are the ones that are not started by Jewish space lasers, right? Well, yeah, those have a special characteristic that's got its own sort of fingerprints. Okay. And, yeah. And a, yeah, good point there, because I was going to ask, <laughs> what is it about science that's been taking a beating lately? Our uh, educational system. That now, I, I'll throw it back, and this is my opinion again, at a lot of these conservative, neoconservative politicians, and there's a religion in there, because I, some of the mainstream religions that I hear, I think they just don't care because they believe their God will take care of it. I've actually read people that, that would say that. People in power, people that, you know, um, well, should yeah, know better. No yeah. kidding. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, it, it's a problem. That, have, you, have you listened right. to our speaker of the house at all? Well, okay. <laughs> and that's, Case in point. that's where it's people in power, the power is the is the issue of, you know, you, you're in power because you want to be in power and you want to stay in power. Yeah, you, yeah. you make sure that people will take for, take what you say as the facts. Okay. So, so j not too many years ago, the naysayers used to say, oh, the climate's not changing. Look at this graph, look at that graph. And, and people are just panicking for, for no reason. The Rush Limbaugh's of the world would, would, uh, talk about this all the time. There's no climate change. Everyone. So now there's been enough things that we all can see something happening. Oh yeah, there's something happening. They're acknowledging, okay, there might be some climate change, but you know, it's changed over the years. Many times we used to have a, uh, a the ice age and things like that. How do we know it isn't just that happening? Exactly. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is that I, I recall when we were in our last ice age, my internet was very unstable <laughs> and it was the sort of thing, it was hard to get the, you know, the kinds of foods that I wanted mm -hmm. from Freddie Myers. Yeah. So it's like, oh wait, no, that's not what anybody, nobody, you know, no. back in the last ice age, right. we were not doing what we're doing now. Oh. And so the magnitude of what we have built up that's based on a very, very stable environment, a stable climate is is what's the big deal. Yeah, things have changed over the last 800,000 years. However, the magnet the rate at which things are changing and the need we have for things not to change are in direct conflict. And did that kind of take off in the uh industrial revolution? And yeah. then which I my little research here uh I don't have the years. I thought I did, but it was like the late 1800s. Right. But now, after this, oh, I don't know, 40s, 50s, 60s, it just got crazy. And, and we're still going crazy. And But we have to keep up with the population, which I believe is could be another part of the problem. I certainly is. I mean, when we were born, there were, I think, 2 billion people, and we're now at 8. And the projection is it will maybe top out at 10, at 10 billion people. And the... Yes. Uh, around the world, many of the more populated countries, their, their population is actually decreasing. Right. Unfortunately, not the ones that we would like it to happen in, but, and and the economists or the politicians are just going crazy. Yeah. How are we going to do this? How, where are we going to get the workers? And there are some people out there that just keep saying, we need more people. We need, we need more, more people. Oh, yes. I, I, I don't Poli buy it. I see a politician talk about, uh, we need more beautiful babies. I feel like you know, some, but anyway. Well. Yeah. Well, we have too many babies. Tough argument, I guess. But it's hard to find a place to park in a lot of places. Yeah, that's yeah. why. I, I, I did read something. It was on the Pew Research. Now, I think they're, you know, reputable uh, yeah, kind of organization. Yeah. Yeah. But about that, and you were talking about the population, I was surprised. It said it was expected to stop growing in around 2100, but at 10.9 billion. <laughs> I mean, isn't there a finite 
yeah. uh, the, amount of people. The, the problem you with, can't, with with pull humans a number is out, I guess we're, we're just too successful as a species. We, you know, if there's a herd of caribou and three or four of the caribou are born uh, disfigured or in some way not able to maintain the herd, they get eaten pretty quickly. They get they get wiped out. Yeah. We do everything we can to to foster those people and keep them going, and we, uh, you know, we can cure damn near everything. Uh, things that were probably put in place by nature to limit our population, we're working like hell to to keep those things down. Yeah, my my ex wife used to say all all the time uh, when we were watching the uh, documentaries about World War One or World War Two. She said, "Well, what would the population be if it wasn't for those?" And maybe that is the human limitation of population. Boy, heck of a way to do it. I mean, I millions of people are killed in those ones. Well, and we don't seem to stop doing that. No. Right. I don't think. Well, uh, before I forget, too, that what about this tipping point do we hear a lot? Um, now, is, is it an actual point? I think that kind of ticks a lot of people off. It doesn't mean, I mean, I don't know where it is, but we hear about it a lot. Uh, people, you know, all oh, the tipping points here. No, then it's not here. But is there one? In to, in your opinion? Um, in direct answer to your question, no, there is not one. There okay. are multiple tipping points. Okay. And as I said, I'm a marine biologist. I spent five years uh, teaching at the University of the Virgin Islands and fell in love with the shallow, cold, shallow water uh, coral reefs. Hmm. Um, if you were to read the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC report, um, they have, and since this is number six of their series, they and each time it's gotten more and more uh, dire. Yeah. Um, they have said that given the amount of heat that we have already in the atmosphere, we have passed the tipping point for the loss of virtually all shallow water, warm water coral reefs. I see that because I am. Um, they, they have lived in Australia for a couple of years and have dived on the Great Barrier Reef. Again, having dived in the Caribbean a lot. And seeing just this earlier this week, a report from one of the marine labs on Little Cayman there, they are doing a talk on the massive coral bleaching from 2023 summer. And I would love to get back down there to be able to see what it's like, but it's a normal uh, event now. And just earlier this week, um, it was reported for the Great Barrier Reef, I believe it's the eighth or maybe the fifth bleaching event in the last eight years. And those are the sorts of things, that's an example of a tipping point where the, the temperature of the, the ocean, they have their own, little, I'll say the, the heat waves that come in. And just like if we have heat waves here, it's going to knock out some people and then we'll recover a little bit. And if we have another one, it'll affect more people and we recover. But then if we have another one or another one, you can only tolerate those sorts of extreme events mm. so often. If, if you want to see damaged coral, you need to dive in the uh, uh, the Florida Keys. Oh, absolutely. I, um, that's pretty much where I learned to dive in. It was some places you can go and it's, it was just beautiful, but then pretty quickly it went downhill. We, had, we were staying in Key West and we had some friends visiting us and they wanted to go on a glass bottom boat. And I tried to discourage him. I said, it's not what you think it's going to be. But anyway, we went out to the glass bottom boat, and they anchored. And the, 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 the not the floor, but the sea, uh, sea floor, I guess, was covered with elkhorn uh, coral that was just broken and flat. There was nothing alive and nothing uh, standing up. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the guide is pointing it out like, now those there are called elkhorn coral and all. And and there's fish all over the place. And I said, what the hell are the fish doing here? And then I realized that they were feeding them off the boat. Well, <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's interesting. But, yeah, it's just disgraceful. But, you know, I dove in the Great Barrier Reef as well, and the dive boat I went out dropped an anchor right into the coral. Now, that's not something, <laughs> something yeah. that we do in Florida or most places. Yeah, that we as humans have done an awful lot just to mess up our environment that is then under stress from climate change, but human use and mm -hmm. just uh, just the display of ignorance. Um, the fact you mentioned yeah. the Florida Keys, they, NOAA, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, that's got excellent records, 
they recorded 101 degrees Fahrenheit was the temperature off the, the coral reef. I remember oh. hearing that. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Basically putting them in a hot tub. Yeah. Yes. And so it's like, well, no wonder things haven't survived. Anyway, so that is one tipping point. There are other tipping points like um, the uh, how much loss of uh, ice in the Arctic is going to allow it to no longer uh, be able to t to accept the heat, and that if there's no if there's the the ice is not there, the summer sun that rad radiates down is going to be absorbed by the water, which is then going to mean more of the ice will melt, which means that it'll stay warm. And so that can be a, a tipping point. Another one is you might have heard of the AMOC, the uh, Atlanta Meridian Overturn Circulation. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's very specific. Well, I current, learned about it. The current about a current. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I learned about that in oceanography fifty years ago, and so it's a well established thing. Basically, if you look on the east coast of the U.S., you'll see the Gulf Stream comes up along there. It goes up to um, the North Atlantic. And as it's going along there, it's uh, water's being evaporated away, so it becomes saltier. As it goes higher, it cools down, so it gets denser for both those purposes. It then sinks down and flows down the uh, to the Antarctic and carrying a cycle of all the water. So the water in the oceans basically turns over every thousand years or so. Wow. However, if you have the Greenland ice sheets that is melting, it puts a whole lot of fresh water on the surface. And the fresh water on the surface means that it's not going to be uh, able to, to it'll, it'll mix in. It's not going to have that uh, water be saltier and denser. And so it will slow down and it may stop. And there is, it, it, the, the challenge is it could happen in the next 10 years or next 200 years. Who knows? It's very, very, and that's where it is so many steps removed, there's a lot of room for uncertainty. But as the people do better, better, better and better uh, models, more and more data, the uncertainty gets less and less, just the time frame. And like, you want to bet how long it's going to take? It's probably going to be affecting your grandkids, maybe yeah. your kids. So that's and part of that part problem, by the way, and people not getting too interested in this, I think, is. Uh, well, you know, by 2075, and you know, mention these dates all the way down, and everybody, oh, I'm not going to live for another 10 years, you know, and I think that's a, a big part of it. I don't yeah. know what I, they think about their I do children too. and grandchildren, and probably that most people don't haven't visited any of these places, no. and that's probably maybe it's out of sight, out of mind. I mean, I was lucky enough to do a little bit of scuba diving when I was stationed on the island of Okinawa, beautiful coral reefs around there, but just, boy, amazing. And so when, now when I hear about these coral bleach, I mean, it, it saddens me to think mm -hmm. that all that wonderful, vibrant sea life is dying. Yeah. yeah, one of the things that we've tried to do in climate activism is to get people connected to what's out there. You know, whether you love the Arctic, whether you love uh, snorkeling, if you love hiking, even if you're a, an avid hunter and you realize that yeah. with more forest fires or with drier changes, you're going to lose that. And so giving, excuse me, giving people a reason to make these changes and say that, all right, I, I think there's something here. Let's take some actions. Um, one thing I did want to say uh, when you're talking about the oil companies, um, I was an environmental consultant. I worked for virtually every one of the super major oil companies, and I helped um, them get environmental permits. And so I know well how dedicated they are to the environment. <laughs> so I was a cost effect. I was somebody that, you know, it slowed schedules down, it, this and that and the other. They did it because they had to. And so that was... Uh, led by, you know, the senior managers. And yet the people I worked with, there are many people that work for oil companies that are very serious, very good, very smart people. And so it's it bothers me a little bit when I hear that it's the oil people. It is like in any corporation, 
It's the people in the lead, the, the, the managers, the senior executives. Those are the ones that pay the money to the uh, PR firms to do um, questionable studies and say, oh, well, we can't do this, we can't do that. So I lay it at very strongly at the, the feet of the senior executives. And um, when we're talking about, all right, we need to trans away, transition away from fossil fuels, absolutely, we have to do that right away. But we also have to see how do we reposition re, um, the people that were like you and me just doing a job, trying to do the, the best thing. And they know that, one, because they are very bright people. And so we do want to make sure that we don't have any more of the um, casualties than necessary. Because too much, as we've seen with Boeing just now, <laughs> that they, or, they wanted profits over everything else, including, oh, too bad, we lost a plane. Uh, too, oh, wait, uh, another plane. Uh. So profits are, um, that, that makes for real challenges. Revenue right, design kind of uh, the tobacco companies here. Absolutely. Not so long ago. But, and I know what you say, yeah, people, you know, the, you, tobacco company, the, 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 the tobacco executives who at the top who knew damn well it was oh, making yeah. people sick, it wasn't going to affect their kids or their family as long as right. they didn't smoke. But this is going to affect everybody. Yeah. Those executives obviously have descendants that are going to be affected by this. And that's what I was talking about the Vietnam War before. Yeah. Uh, how can they do this? Uh, and, and are they legitimately trying to do anything to, to fix things other than just for PR purposes? From my, per my perspective, they are not. Um, there are some, there, I think it was the Danish, see the Danish or the Dutch national com uh, oil company um, sold off all of their um, oil and gas holdings and they went in strong with an offshore wind. And um, they are now the, the, they produce more energy from offshore wind than anybody else. But that meant they didn't, they weren't an oil company that was doing renewables. They're no longer an oil company. So it's like, well, is, is there room for an oil company to be an energy company? And my sense is they will do nothing to undermine their fundamental uh, way of making money, which is selling oil. I'm glad you mentioned windmills because I almost forgot them. There's a very controversial subject, especially right here. I was uh, talking to one of my neighbors this morning, and uh, he was concerned about the noise that the, that the that the windmills make going into the ground, or uh, the, the offshore ones affecting the wildlife. And uh, what what is your opinion on that? In fact, we had you know, I mean, there's it's causing the whales to uh, beach, and it's causing cancer. It's reducing your uh, your property value. It's doing all kinds of awful things. I'm. I really would like to see the data to support any of that. You know, I and I'm a little unsure. We, oh, you we don't talk about that. And I, I, I'm disappointing. I thought you were going to give us a big rah rah. No. <laughs> oh, oh, not supporting any of that. I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm. It, it, it's, again, it's kind of like with the climate change, I go back to the basic physics and I want to see what are the data that support it. And if I'll, and, and as compared to many people during COVID, they said, well, I did my own research. It's like, I doubt you did your own research. YouTube is On great. Facebook. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Right. But That's what part I of the problem. like to see is here's an article, whether it's from um, the Grist or the New York Times or the Washington Post or CNN or whatever, what was the study that they cited? And then if they don't give it, it's like, well, okay, be questioning that. And sometimes the studies they give you, they give you a lot of detail saying, well, we think there's this, but there are all these other things. So all of that inf extra information usually doesn't come through because you've only got, what, five seconds, 30 seconds to report a story. And if it's not exciting, it's not something that grabs you, you don't click on it or you don't continue to, to follow it. So as a marine biologist, do you think that the, the, uh, the offshore windmills actually do affect the wildlife? Um, they will affect the wildlife. That's no question. If you put anything out there, every sure. time a boat goes out, it affects the wildlife because yeah. one of the worst it seems things... seems to me one of the things they're going to be adding is artificial reefs, which are good. 
Um, yes and no. I say that because um, most of if you know, if you've been to the to the um, Channel Islands, you've been to Southern Southern California, and you've seen the the um, uh, oil platforms out there. Mm -hmm. Um, I just the other day saw a very interesting video by someone that was talking at Hopkins Marine Station about exactly that. And he said that um, those platforms are anchored to the bottom. And so that provides all sorts mm -hmm. of, of uh, restructure in that. What we have off here is not on the bottom. They are tethered to the bottom. Oh, okay. But off here... It's going to be on the order of 600 to 1,300 meters. So we're talking 2,000, 3,000 feet. And so they are not going to have the same footprint as the, as what we're used to of thinking about those. Okay. And um, they will, the most of the effect for, well, there was a big, big dis distribution um, in the water column for those, uh, those um, uh, oil platforms. Big effect was at the top which would be the upper 30 feet is probably where you're going to have the turbines. That's, that's as deep as they're going to, the, the foundation will be. So you'll expect some of that. But in terms of how that's going to affect all the things, I put a, I, I submitted an a, um, uh, editorial or a, a guest editorial to the pilot just a couple of weeks ago, um, which was, I think, published three weeks ago. And that was about what has happened in California. And the uh, California Energy Commission just released their report that said that um, how is California going to be meeting all of their uh, energy demands? How is that fit with offshore wind? That's fundamentally, is they in their report, they identified five areas that are basically from here on down to Mendocino. I say here because it's the California border. We're not far from it. And they are going to, I guarantee, because they have to meet their needs and they're doing it full, full force in offshore wind. Those impacts will be there. And so what I am saying is we here in Oregon have to understand exactly the questions you're asking, right? What do we know? What don't we know? Um, because it's very easy to speculate. But it takes time, it takes energy, it takes money to address these very specific questions. And that hasn't been allocated. The um, last summer, the governor and our federal representatives, um, coastal representatives said, we need to slow things down. I say, great, we need to, if you are then making the study, doing the studies to answer the questions that people are asking, very, very valid questions. Um, Ann Valaisis, the, uh, the uh, president of the County Opsis Audubon, gave a really good presentation that showed just how incredibly diverse our area here in Curry County, offshore wind, off, excuse me, offshore uh, islands are for breeding. And it's, it's amazing. And so now we need, one, is to understand what is that resource. Second is how could those, uh, those birds be affected by something that is going to be 20 or more uh, miles offshore. And so we, if we slow down, or even if we don't slow down, there will be nothing put out there for at least, I'll say, five to seven years. That's plenty of time to start the studies, get the data, and have an honest um, discussion about what, what do we do, what, whether we do it or not. And we have to be saying, if it gets to this level of an impact. We've decided right now that's no good. That's not going to be what we as Oregonians are going to be willing to accept. But we can't do it five years, seven years down the line when they've done all this investment and stuff. And so I'd say it's going to take so long. There's lots of time for discussion. But we have to now decide what are the important, what are the there are tipping points, if you will. Yeah. We don't want to have that happen. And how do we get those data so that we make intelligent decisions? Because I absolutely guarantee we will not have all the information we need to answer all those questions. And we're going to have to say, we know the climate is changing. We know that the, the ocean is heating up. I mean, it's ocean this last year was the hottest it's ever been recorded yeah. worldwide. 
And every month over the last eight months has been the hottest month on record, and it continues. And so we know there are major changes, and those will influence what happens onshore, offshore. And so with this incomplete collection of data, how do we make these very tough decisions? And one of the most important things I'll never be able to influence, but get the damn politics out of it. Well, Politics yes. and science don't well, the, matter. Well, the hardest to do, you know, and uh, of course there's big controversy. In other words, I guess long range, there's still a lot of unknowns out there about. Absolutely. Uh, and I, they, I just watched a local humble uh, program there uh, last week, and they had they were talking about that and how I didn't know this. I guess the ocean from a roughly central California up to southern Oregon is unique in the wind and the way the wind affects it. And then you know, here I go. I don't know what I'm talking, but they were talking about it. Right. It's very special and unique. It is. And so, yeah, it's something we have to be concerned about. But there are, there's got to be trade-offs, I think, or, or compromise, which doesn't seem to happen anymore. Um, yeah. You know, on, okay, the, the wind power isn't all, isn't 100% wonderful, but is it still, do we keep burning coal, which is finite, and oil, and you know what I'm right. saying, all of yeah. that stuff. Before I, I just have one little good snippet of good news I was reading about dealing with the crab fishermen. They're now talking about, because I, I just went up to Harris Beach uh, the last couple months ago to watch whales. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I noticed a lot of crab pots out there, and I know they're tethered. And, but now they're talking about they, they've got people smart enough to invent a crab pot that will not be tethered, and they can oh, set yeah. it down. And then, uh, I don't know, here we go, computers, you can send, and send it a, a, a signal and the thing will float to the top. Yeah, I mean, I think that's you know one little tiny yes, that's uh, step forward, maybe. Yeah. But question yeah. is, how much does that increase the price of the crabs? Big time. And, and you're, there you go. There, it, yeah. right? Like, and again, it, it's the trade offs. Yeah. And what I what I am very very passionate about and and strong advocate is for exactly these kinds of questions and com conversations. Um, I've said before that the state couldn't have done a better job of uniting the environmentalists and the MAGA folks that live here because you see the exact same sign of no windmills in the si in the front yards of people yeah. that also have, hey, Brandon, or okay, oh, Brandon, yeah. Yeah. and the Black Lives Matter. And it's like, wow, you've done a great job. And that is largely because of a lack of information, a lack of communication, and the loudest voices are being heard. And that's not to discount those. It's just the state hasn't done a very good job of saying, all right, the Oregon Department of Energy wrote a paper based on a, a House Bill 3375 that said, write this paper, show the, pen the benefits and the challenges with offshore wind. Very well done. It has never been discussed. It has never been laid out. So it's like, wow, that's where we need to have the state take a lead because, boom, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the feds, are making lockstep going forward with that. And, and so, politics is in the middle of all that. Absolutely. Yeah. We have a few minutes left, uh, and maybe you could... Uh, give us all reason to get in our car and go home. Are you optimistic about anything at all? Yes, um, very much so. And there's a little bit of, well, we have to be because being pessimistic and going, oh, hell, that, <laughs> uh, that doesn't do any good. More importantly, if you look at the, the changes that are happening, um, even in China, they have done more in renewables than any other country whatsoever um, in the amount of, of solar and wind. It's absolutely amazing. And in 2022, they did as much as the rest of the world combined. 2023, they doubled it for something. You know, it's like, oh, wait a second. We've that got- shocks me. I had no idea. Exactly. I, I just and, learned from my neighbor this morning that if you're building a house in California, it has to have solar panels on it. Right. That, that's, yep. that's very encouraging. Yeah. And so the, the EVs are getting more and more people are buying them. And it's all right. And if then they're being attacked. 
and being attacked. Yeah. And it's uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act that had money for the chargers, which is des- are desperately needed, but they have to be supported by uh, an updated grid. And one of the things that offshore wind would do, it would pre- they would precipitate an increase in the offshore of the, um, the the grid to make us more resilient, be more prepared for changes. So there's so many things that fit together that we are slowly but surely making progress despite too much of the politics. Mm-hmm. And if we could get people to talk civilly and have discussions and say what we do know and what we don't know and acknowledge that we have to make some very difficult decisions, we shouldn't be having a few people be the winners and a lot of people being the losers. How do we make that all the right balance? Hmm. Yeah, that's <laughs> talking I got my silly doesn't car seem to happen it. anymore lately. But uh, right. it, it, you know, I am optimistic enough to think hopefully soon it will be. Yeah, yeah, I really do. When, and, I, when I got my electric car, I was so proud of myself. I was doing such a good <laughs> thing, and now people try to make me feel bad about it. But it's you know, I keep saying with electric cars, is they're they're basically in the Model T stage. Yeah, yeah. yeah when Model Ts came out, cars first came out, they they, they can edit it. Yeah. There, uh, there were lots of problems with them, whole bunches of problems with them. And if somebody decided that, sorry, we can't have that Model T because of this, this, and this, I don't know. Maybe yeah. we'd still be uh, using horses. My mother told me a very interesting story. I tried to get her to capture some of the things that she knew as a, gro- as a growing up. She said she was on the order of eight or nine, and she was riding around with her best friend. Her mother was driving their electric car. Yeah. And it was with a joystick. Yeah. And that was in, what, 1920-something? Yeah. And so and they they've been before, Yeah, they were actually more popular before gas cars were. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They, so. can, they can edit it. <laughs> Ray got mad at me. No, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't tell me. Uh, so any final comments from anybody? Um, I just want to sort of double down hate that word because it's so Trumpian, but <laughs> on on the positive, you know, we do have to, to make some tough decisions and we really, really have to get past the, um, the other people being the uh, bad people. Yeah. And we have to be having discussions because the decisions, if we don't make them, if we don't make them by, by really talking to each other, they, they'll make themselves. You know, the coral reefs are probably gone. What happens if any one of the tipping points goes and it turns out to be the one where all of a sudden nature is putting lots of carbon dioxide or lots of methane in the air? Yeah. And then we have to resort to extraordinary extreme measures. Definitely don't want to do that. Like going to Mars. Yeah, well, there's yeah, that. It's, that, that <laughs> I find that to be incredible. There are actual serious scientists talking about moving to Mars. I think it would be more serious entrepreneurs or um, people that want to make lots of money, but that's my own bias. <laughs> I have a, a, a fish tank at home that I keep frogs in, and that's how we would live is like in that fish tank. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I, because my wife is in a book club and they're reading uh, Red Mars by uh, Kim Stanley Robinson. It's a part of a trilogy and Stan got... Um, some science, very high level science fiction um, award for the series. And that's it. That's where they, it shows people going to Mars and having to maybe terraform it so that it becomes more Earth-like. But in the process, maybe not use, you know, it, it would It'd change. It would be a whole lot easier to fix the problems. I'm getting yelled at by the engineer that we need to shut this down. <laughs> thank you very much, Bill, for coming. Yeah, thank and- you, Bill. Right. I think we only Thank got started, so we'll have yeah. to have some more. Yeah. yeah, this is certainly do more than an hour. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you.